Hey, hello again, everybody. Um, this is some more footage that I forgot to post. So I'm, I forgot footage on two channels. I just did my Eurovin channel for my three month trip in Europe. I just put something on that. But for this one, for my travels here in the US, um, after Europe, I was home for about three, four days. Uh, this is the beginning of uh, the month of September in 2023. And I uh, flew out to um, Dayton, Ohio for a friend's uh, retirement, Air Force retirement. And then I went to the uh, Air Force, the United States Air Force Museum, right there at Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. It's a great museum. Give yourself a couple of hours. I mean, it's just an awesome, awesome museum. A lot of, a lot of um, one of a kind. There, actual planes. Um, one of my one of the highlights for me was the box car, which was the second B twenty nine bomber that bought, dropped an atomic bomb on Nagasaki. It'll be in the footage. So um, I'm just now getting getting to putting this stuff on. So this footage was taken like the first month of September of two thousand twenty three, and today is March sixteenth, two thousand twenty four. Took me this long, but I'm starting to work on my motorcycle again. So I want to clear this all out so I can start doing some more motorcycle footage. All right, enjoy the video. Hello, everybody. I'm in Dayton, Ohio, at the uh, Wright-Patterson United States Air Force Museum. It's a huge museum. I was out here about 20 years ago when I was air crew on C-141s, a little over 20 years ago, probably 23. I'm at the air park right now. I'm doing a little bit of a video outside. I'm going to put this video on both my channels because there's some overlapping uh, information. There's going to. I briefly went in there yesterday where I attended a retirement. And while I was in there, they have a really good uh, section for World War II and the Cold War. A lot of the things that I had seen firsthand while I was in France, Germany, and Poland. So I'm going to hit that up in a moment. I'm going to try and make this brief. There's so much in this museum, I could do hours of videos. I'm going to try to keep this one 20 minutes or less. Um, I'm going to flip it around real quick and show you some things. Uh, the air the air park is kind of small, actually, for what's on the outside, where sometimes it's opposite, where there's a lot in the air park, and there's a little bit indoors, but they have a lot in there. I will do some video on some specific one-of-a-kinds aircrafts. I will say in advance that I have been to this museum before, I've been to the Smithsonian, and I've been to Kitty Hawk. All three locations have a Wright Flyer, which is known to fly at Kitty Hawk. The original one is actually at the Smithsonian in D.C., and... There's some kind of car show going on, so you can hear a lot of car engines. Let me flip this around and I'll show you some things. Wow, the sun's really bright today. So, okay, in, in the air park, the only thing I was just gonna point out, and it's right in front, but when I was air crew, I was primarily on the C-141s, but boy, my glasses are not cooperating. I was uh, uh, mainly on C-141s, but there's a C-17 uh, Globemaster right there in the background. I, I did get trained and crewed on one of those. Um, there's a KC-135 uh, right there. We trained on that for aircraft of opportunity. There's a C-130, which runs in the Army as an Army paratrooper. Uh, no, that's not a C-130 had four blades. That might be a C-123. I'm not sure what that is. So I'm not going to go any further on that. And then you got a um, uh, Warthog, A-10 Warthog. The museum has expanded. They have these hangar-shaped buildings. I think there's four in succession. So right in front of me is where you enter, and that's kind of like where the retirement was yesterday. And then you have like four of these hangars. One, two, three, and then there's a fourth one over there that I'll be going through and just doing some really quick snippets of some Cold War things, some World War II um, displays, and then a, a few unique aircraft. I hope to get this under 20 minutes. Bye. This museum also has a great um, air park on the outside. There's a lot of exhibits out here. But uh, one thing I do want to mention, this museum, I don't expect to see a lot of foreign aircraft. And that's why, although a lot of people will argue that this is the best museum in the world, it's not an inclusive museum. I think about the museum in Palm Springs, California. And what that air museum prides itself on is, is um, every aircraft they have is in flying condition. They actually have pans underneath the engines to you know, catch the oil. And those all their planes periodically fly. That's very notable. Other museums, such as March Air Force Base, will have uh, aircraft from other countries. Germany during World War II and some of the, uh, the British aircraft. And I think they have one, I want to say it's called an Aero Cobra. 
um, it's one where the engine was mounted in the middle and they have like the only one in existence is at the March Air Force Base Museum in Riverside, California. But this museum will cover uh, flight from the inception of flight with the Wright brothers all the way up to uh, space shuttle missions, UAV vehicles and operations uh, and uh, rockets and missiles and, and beyond. I'm probably looking forward to what the future has to offer. So this is really a um, A to Z museum where it encompasses the the theory and the evolution of flight, especially regarding the United States, but it's not all inclusive uh, where I would say, yeah, once you see this museum, there's no others that compare. It is very extensive, very unique, but it's not the end all. So I would say if you're in the area, this is a definite visit for Dayton, Ohio. Absolutely, it should be number one visit. Uh, just like going to Normandy and going to the cemetery there, that would be the first thing on the list. So follow along with me, I'll point out a few unique things, but once again, it's so extensive that it's virtually um, impossible to catch it all on a YouTube video. So the first exhibit you come into, when you come into the Air Museum, to the left, right after the entry, is this. So this is going to go over some of the areas I saw while I was in Europe. And there's that, that sign again, which is uh, work will set you free. So this is just a short, I'm, I'm kind of surprised they have it. This is just a little short exhibit. It's not, it's probably 30 feet in depth. Um, a lot of these, all these sites that they're showing is um, Auschwitz and then um, some on Dachau. I've uh, Betchenwald also. Um, what they're saying here, there's this, these were some, some of these death camps that actually put military POWs in. There's a quilt here, which I'll get a closer look at. But the design of this exhibit, I'm trying to surmise why they have the, um, the walls the way they do, the way they show these debrided walls. I'm either thinking this could be like what it might have looked like uh, when Warsaw was destroyed, that the um, museum curators wanted to depict that in this display area, or I'm also thinking this could be the chambers that I saw in Dachau where you had the different compartmental rooms to the um, gas chambers and then the incinerary area. So there are, they are showing different um, uh, camps that I didn't go to, but it's all pretty much, pretty much the same. The one interesting thing about, oh, hold on. I wonder if that's the pool, the pool that I saw in, uh, Auschwitz. If you guys saw my earlier videos, I saw a pool there. I have to come back to that. But one unique thing that I did not see a lot of in any museum, I saw maybe one or two were the uniforms. And they have one of them here, here in the United States at this museum. And it talks about, you know, who wore it and how they got it here and stuff. Um, The person who donated it, I guess his father wore this. So I maybe saw one or two the whole time I was in Germany and Poland that were in display cases. I thought I was gonna see more, but they're just not around. So being that I, I did extensive um, videos while I was in Germany and Poland, I mean, this all looks very familiar. I'm not gonna do a whole lot with this one. I just wanted to, uh, show you um this jacket uh native from dayton ohio sergeant delbert cooper he liberated he was with the army's fourth regiment 71st infantry um so he's one of the guys that liberated dachau i'm sorry i don't know which one i don't know which camp he liberated so um and then there's this so i'm gonna read over it a little bit i'm not gonna do too much so like I said, I really went over a lot of this while I was in Europe. It's just very interesting that this is the first exhibit I ran into when I come back to um, this museum. So this first gallery is early flight. And they actually have, a, I, want, I think this is a British Spitfire. So, de Havilland A2 Tiger Moth. So there are some foreign aircraft in here in the earlier stages of flight. I believe they have, I think this is where the, well, sorry. 
Is this the replica the right now? Some engines. I think the replica of the right flyer is in a different building. But this is pretty interesting on how the uh, World War One aircraft. I don't know if this is an original one sitting in front of me or not, or if this is a reproduction. I'll check it out real quick. So this is an actual aircraft that was Italian built using the Italian Air Force. Um, this is an, an original. That's amazing. Used in World War One. Uh, footnote: We were allies with the Italians in World War One. I don't see a lot of these older aircraft in museums, so I'm probably gonna spend more time in this area. But there was one other. Oh, that's that's what I saw. I'm looking at the tail of that Italian aircraft, and you can see the Italian flag pattern. So as weight is always a concern when it comes to moving anything a few, a few inches or a few feet off the ground, especially in flight. So this is showing you how the earlier aircrafts, uh, their framework was lightweight wood. So that's the skeleton, and that skeleton was basically covered with cloth. Even the fuselage would have been covered with cloth. Here's actually a good example of what I was talking about. You see the skeletal structure in the wings, and then you see the cloth or canvas stretched over the wings and over the fuselage of this aircraft. So this aircraft is uh, portraying, this is a reproduction built in 1955. The original of this aircraft is in the Smithsonian, same as the Wright Flyer, the, the first Wright Flyer. As you see, there are two people in here. This very well could be the one that was crashed where that one lieutenant was killed. But um, this is called uh, Signal Corps number one. So the original is at the Smithsonian in Washington, DC. So in this display case, there's a cloth fabric here which is remnants of what was originally on the 1903 flyer. This actually came off the original 1903 flyer. Once again, the original one is in, once again, Washington, D.C. And then I'm gonna point out that is still, still till today, the symbol of the Signal Corps corpse, which is a, a, a big white square with a smaller red square in the middle. So even officers will wear that as a signal insignia. One thing I was going to show you on the 1911 model is, uh, this is 1911, one significant change or a notable change is that they started mounting wheels on them, on the front and back, opposed to the 1909, they were still using skids and rails. So apparently this was something tested at Fort Lewis, Washington right before I got up to Fort Lewis. I heard about this. I never saw it with my own eyes, but apparently it was tested. That might be Fort Lewis. I don't know, but there's, there's a real one there. <laughs> So this is the first, for lack of a better term, like the hangar. It's one of those big curved domes. I'm still on the first one. And uh, surprisingly so, um, oh, I think this is the Flying Tigers, the volunteers that flew out of China uh, to attack Japan. But there are, there are some foreign aircraft. Oh, there's a Japanese one right here. So there are some foreign aircraft here. And I'm not sure, that's a B-18. I read it, I would have not have known what that was. But that's a B-18 right there. And this looks like a B-25 Mitchell. I forgot if it was the B-25 or the B-26 that the Doolittle Raid used. Nonetheless, they were, I thought those guys were real for a second. Nonetheless, they were um, both medium bombers. The B-25, the way I look at them, the B-25 had a split tail. The B-26 had a single tail in the back. And I can't, I really don't know much more differences than that. There's probably a B-26 in here somewhere. Okay, so here's a B-24 Liberator. 
and I think there's only a few of these that still fly, if at all. Now, whether this nose art is the exact plane, I know if it, if it is, this one has significant uh, historical, um, historical significance. This was a heavy bomber, four engine heavy bomber in the same class as the B-17. Oh, and there's the Lady Be Be Good propeller. Oh my goodness. Check this out. Okay, so the Lady Be Good, just look it up. I can't, I don't have time to explain it. I read the book. Um, there's a, a couple of books and movies that portray it, but look up Lady Be Good. This is very, very interesting history. It was a B-24 Liberator, and I think that's the engine cowling. This is amazing. I'm very much into the story of the Lady Be Good, but it was a B-24 Liberator that, Liberator that flew out of, I think it was called, I wanna say Wheeler Field in Libya, and it was supposed to go on the Playoisti, the Romanian um, fuel, uh, oh, I'm losing my train of thought. Bombing of Ploiesti in Romania, bombing the fuel depots. It was on that mission. It had a malfunction. It turned around. Uh, it turned around in flight, and navigation was off, and the water was so subtle going up to the shoreline. When they got over the sand, they still thought the gentle rolling of the sand was the um, ocean and they ended up running out of fuel and crashing and they were found by British Petroleum like in the 1960s, of course they were all dead. But I did not expect to see this. So I'm gonna pause this and take some pictures uh, of the Lady Be Good artifacts that are here. So I'm at the tail end of the B-24 Liberator, which um, you know has a lot of similarities and purposes to the B-17, which is right next door to me. I'll, I'll film that also. You know, this is one thing when we talk about what pressurized aircraft did um, as World War II came to an end with the B-29 Super Fortress, which I hope I see one. I'm, I'm sure I will. There's got to be a Super Fortress here. But all that was open air. So anything over 10,000 feet, uh, crew would get really cold and they would have to wear supplementary O2 um, over their faces because cruise altitude and cabin altitude obviously were the same whereas in today's world you can be on a commercial flight at 32,000 feet and your cabin altitude is pressurized about 8,000 so what I'm walking up to now is the B-17 this is an F model and this is the Memphis Bell the Memphis Bell uh, look this one up to get more details um, popular bomber in World War II I think it did like straight 25 missions this one's in this is it and it's in pristine condition I'm surprised this isn't at the Smithsonian. Uh, one thing I'm really not familiar with, because I built models of these things, I don't remember anything with, with, with the 250 cals up front and then 250 cals. So that has 450 cals in the front. I know different crews did different modifications. Now, this was a B, this is an F series. And why I say that, uh, people under the B-17s, you're used to seeing the chin gun, where they mounted, they took them out of the nose and they mounted uh, a chin turret right here and the nose of the aircraft and that would be the b-17g which was probably the last model in production towards the end of world war ii but uh the b-17 is well worth doing a walk around i don't think no there's no mezzanine level so i really can't get on top of it but you know it talks about the engines talks about the ball turret oh, i really wanted this to be a short video but this is like one of my favorite favorite airplanes um the funny story about the b-17s i read a book called the last mission I had a b-17 and then i read, read one called flying sand and i didn't know any better i actually thought that uh, b-17s were still flying in 1980s and i wanted to be a b-17 uh waste gunner <laughs> that's what got me to go to the army recruiter so there's a waste gun right there and then i'll, I'll show you the tail the ball turrets there this is a really cool exhibit They had, if anyone, life expectancy wise, was the, the ball turn and the tail gunner. I think the tail gunner was the most vulnerable and, and possibly the first that would probably get killed and then the ball turn after that. Amazing, this is in pristine condition. So this is a B-26 Marauder and this is, looks a lot like that, that B-25 Mitchell. So it was the B-25 Mitchell with the split tail that was that Doolittle used for the Doolittle raid. I believe it was like April of 1943, which was just a handful of months after the, um, after the uh, 
Pearl Harbor bomb bombing of that previous December. But this is what I was talking about. You have a single tail there. Uh, you still got a top turret, both medium bombers. Uh, they did take off from an aircraft carrier, which they had to strip them down. And there is um, there is uh, one, uh, two engines. Two engines where the heavy bombers are four. There's a glider. Uh, I walked into one of those at the um, Utah Beach Museum, I think it was. I get confused now. There's a video of me walking through one of these gliders um, in the beaches of Normandy. I think it was the Utah Beach one. Here is a C-47, I want to say. A CG-4A. Oh, no, no, that's a glider. That's one of the glider. I think this is a C... Uh, oh, airborne scooter. I saw one of those in... I saw one of those in uh, one of my videos. It shows a guy riding one of those. But, okay, I'm going to say C-47. The, the, the fuselage um, landing gears in the tail. And there's your invasion stripes. So this was used for the paratroopers. And speaking of paratroopers, you guys know I went to that the Air, Airborne Museum and I did see a lot of these guys. So this one is from the 82nd, which um, I know I went over pretty pretty well when um, they all have these, like, these little landmine things on their ankles. I didn't realize it, but some kind of little mine or something they said. But you have another oh i've talked about this so the so the the this is a static line that that metal cord is a static line it runs the length of the aircraft so when we would stand up if they stand up hook up you're hooking this up you're um I, I don't know the correct term anymore but you hook that up to the static line and then as you jump up that static line is still attached to the aircraft and this cord see what those rubber bands are rubber bands it, it pulls that out and it goes pop 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 and then that back of the parachute, it just pulls the parachute out and this thing called a bridle ring. And that's the last point of contact. It pulls it out and then it detaches from the aircraft. So the, the shroud or the casing of the parachute and the bridle ring and that white part stays with the aircraft. And the jump master or the load master pulls them back in. And then there's the 82nd patch there. So, and then when I did that D-Day experience, this is the type of plane I was on when I did that video where the plane crashes and that little girl in front of me freaks out. Yeah, this is the uh, type of plane I was in. I'm pretty sure the whole thing was a mock-up at that time. But uh, yeah, cool, and there's the glider above me. Uh, so it is a C-47D. This is a German aircraft area, and this is really interesting because you have one of the first German, um, I wanna say rocket-powered, there's a little difference between what rocket and jet is. Uh, so there's no intakes here to make it really a jet. <laughs> and that's not the main propulsion system. So this little thing, you would have um, a rocket like in the back that would propel it forward. So there's no intake. It's just like a, like a rocket, and it's hard to explain. It's probably described in here. Let me read it real quick. There you go, it explains it right there. The German ME-163 rocket-powered defensive fighter was one of the most unusual aircraft of World War II. Okay, so you go from that rocket-powered one to a uh, jet, and the jet one is right over here. So these were actually in production and used towards the end of uh, World War II. Bomber crews were maybe the first ones to see these guys. They were very formidable against any other aircraft we would have at the time, such as the P-51 Mustang. This is, uh, they're talking about the jet engine here. The, the internal functioning of the jet engine. It's an ME-262. So this is ME-262 um, used in combat. And I think there's a couple of stories where some, maybe some uh, P-51 Mustangs shot them down. I forgot exactly. But unfortunately for Germany, they had a production and fuel shortage and they weren't able to really make these uh, a turning point for them. Um, this is really cool and worth noting. This eagle and this head of Hitler, these are actual World War II relics. i kind of amazed that they're here, actually. The eagle was, um, uh, Bronze Eagle was one of the two that stood at the entrance of, to Hitler's office in the Reich Chancellery in Berlin, and then this one has bullet holes in it. 
that's a, the head of Hitler with, a, with bullet holes in it. And that was um, General von Rundstedt's headquarters in Saint Germain, France. So there were actually two World War II relics that were, were actually there. I thought it was just for, you know, to go along with this uh, diorama. I really didn't expect to see so many uh, German aircraft, foreign aircraft here. So, one, oh my goodness, is this the real boxcar? Okay, so check this out, people. I've been talking about the twin B-29 super fortresses and how they were pressurized. And then I come across this B-29 and the significant thing about it, if this is the boxcar, I had no idea it was still in existence. The boxcar was the second B-29 to drop the, I think it was the um, little boy. I forgot which was dropped first. We had the fat man and we had the little boy, but the boxcar was the second bomber, the second B-29 Super Fortress that um, dropped the bomb on Nagasaki. Well, it says it right there. But if this is the actual box car, now I, I did see the Enola Gay, um, and, and the Enola Gay was named after Paul Tibbetts' mom, Enola Gay. Uh, so, and then Box, the way it's spelled, that was his last name, B-O-C-K-S. That was the pilot's last name, but they used it like a double entendre type of thing and called it Box Car. And then you have this thing that says Nagasaki right there. If, if this is just not a mock-up, this is amazing. I'm actually looking at this bomber. The box car. Uh, while I'm looking at it, I'm just gonna remember when I was saying, you know, talking about pressurization and stuff. The other bombers I was showing you, if you looked at the, uh, especially like the um, the waste gunners, they were open to the air, and this one doesn't even have a. There's the bombardier there, the Norden bomb site, but these were all sealed. That's why you would have. Oh, there's. Okay, here we go. Check this out. Okay, so the fat man. This is a. This was um, the first atomic bomb, and there's a, a reproduction of it. So the Fat Man um, was delivered by Boxcar over Nagasaki, the Fat Man. And then here's um, a reproduction of the Little Boy, Little Boy atomic bomb that was used over uh, Hiroshima, and that was by the, um, the Enola Gay. Every time I say something, the, the, the museum <laughs> it confirms it. It's kind of cool. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just walk around a little bit. This is a very, very uh, impressive aircraft for me to see. I wonder if a lot of people that come here know the significance of it. And so this symbol on the back with the arrow. Oh, kamikaze. That symbol on the back um, with the arrow is indicative for right field right here in Dayton, Ohio. So once again, you have a sealed waste gun. That sealed the ball turret. This doesn't have the top turret. Um, they were they were automated. They didn't have crews crewmen in them. And it looks like the tail gun. You saw the guy crewing it, but it was sealed up also to um, control the uh, cabin pressure. Now it looks like this one didn't have armament on it. I don't know if it was taken off later, but once again, they flew so high and for that particular mission, they didn't need it. There was nothing to oppose them. They didn't have, you know, there's a thing called air superiority and air supremacy. Air superiority means you have the edge that, you know, there's still a, a posable threat out there, whether it be anti-aircraft or uh, interceptors, but you're superior to them. Air supremacy means there's nothing that's going to touch you. It's a milk run. You're, you're flying, you don't have to worry about enemy anything. So at that time of the bombing, we actually had air supremacy, which gave us um, carte blanche of the airways. There was nothing that was gonna touch these bombers as they flew over uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Therefore, they may have just disregarded any of the turrets or the guns to, can, to get that cabin pressure applicable to uh, get the, that higher flight altitude. So I'm not surprised to see that there are no guns on it because there wouldn't be any need for those up there. They probably just left the tail guns intact. And that actually looks like this is a retrofitted radar of some kind. I'm not sure. But there you go. There's the box car. I don't think I've ever seen this before. 
This is the one that um, concluded the war. So the Enola Gay dropped the first one, and its, not its notoriety is it dropped the first atomic bomb, the boxcar is the one that ended the war in Japan, thus ending World War II in its entirety. Before I break off this section, I'm just gonna show you how this museum does a really cool depiction of a couple of different countries and what their Air Force uniforms would have looked like. So you got US, Royal, Brazilian, Luftwaffe, Italian, Japanese, and Mexican? What in the world? Okay, this is, not, this is something I know nothing about. I have no idea what Mexico's involvement ever was when it came to World War II. So I'm gonna take a moment and read up on this because I don't think they had any existence at all, or any involvement at all in World War II. So in the second exhibit hall that I'm in, there's something that I didn't see uh, 23 years ago. So I believe this is a Raptor, uh, UAV, uh, unmanned aerial vehicle. There's a Global Hawk. Uh, you can tell the difference. The Global Hawk doesn't have any armament on it. It's used for uh, surveillance and reconnaissance. And this is actually an attack UAV with the armament on it. I don't know much about how what the UAV strategies and tactics are, but I can imagine that they can be used in conjunction if this is a high altitude flyer, this um, one that would be looking at the ground. Maybe they can get some imagery or some sensors in conjunction with aiding that one. But uh, once again, I have, I've, I've never dealt with them in my military career in any kind of capacity. So I can read about them, but I don't have time for that. And then also, I don't know what this Boeing one is up top. That might be a concept thing. It looks like it is manned. I don't think it's a UAV. I think it is manned. And then underneath it, F-35 or F-22. Let me see how close I am to this. Uh, F-22 Raptor. That's what I'm standing in front of. The thing above me, I don't know what the heck that is. That. Uh, so I looked around, I didn't see anything to tell me what that thing that's hanging from the ceiling is. Uh, going over here to the Korean War, first um, time we used jet aircraft in combat, F-28 Sabre, which I think there's one right in front of me, was the uh, mainstay going up. This is an F-80. So, but there are a couple of other earlier jet fighters here on this part of the exhibit. Okay, so here's the F-86, American jet fighter. Look at the similarities to its adversary, which was the uh, MiG-15. So these two tangled up a lot <laughs> in the skies over Korea. You can see where the tail on the Sabre is at the fuselage, and the tail of the um, MiG is higher up. So very similar in design, um, but you know something? I think any true affection out of this era aircraft can tell me, oh no, they're not similar at all. They just look the same. So with my novice knowledge of these two fighters, I'm going to leave it at that. Now this one here, this twin Mustang, I just know a little bit about, but what's significant about me, I've never seen one in person. So it has, it has two full fuselages joined at the tail and I believe either pilot and either um, canopy, either cockpit can control the aircraft. Looks like that that's where the guns were and the tail is joined in the back. But I have never seen one of these in person before. I've seen them in pictures, I've seen them in documentaries. I did walk past this one yesterday and it caught my eye saying, wow, there's, there's one. Now, I, I don't even know if they were actually used in combat or if it was just a concept idea. But I'll leave that up to you to look up on the internet if you're so interested. This is the official football helmet for NATO forces of the world. I just can never pass up looking at these Jeeps, no matter which museum I go to. I see a Jeep. <laughs> I, see a, I see a Jeep, I got a photograph it or take a picture of it. Hey, there's a M1 carbine.
I got one of those at home. And, oh my goodness, if you guys saw my Normandy ones, I kept telling you guys, I've never, in Normandy, I've never seen one with a bayonet lug, but that right there, just if I get my finger on it, right there is the bayonet lug, meaning that you would put the bayonet over the, the round part of it, but it goes over the barrel, and then the locking part goes right over there. But every single M1 carbine I saw when I was in, uh, in the Normandy museums, the real ones, they were actual ones, none of them had that bayonet lug there. The one I have at home does have it. So that is amazing that I'm here at this museum and I'm looking at an M1 carbine that has the bayonet lug on it. Wow. And this soldier actually has an authentic uh, bayonet on his side. That was a leather handle that you're looking at. You see that ring? That's what I was talking about. That little whole ring on the on camera's left side, that goes over the barrel of the M1 carbine. And then the handle portion slips down. There's a little notch in the handle that slips into that bayonet leg and locks into place. That's um, really interesting that I'm back in the United States and that's the first time I see one. Mine has it back at home. I just never seen it on the ones when I was in Normandy. Now a big game changer in the Korean War when it came to uh, aviation was the use of the helicopter. And it was used, honestly, more on a tactical level. Um, and uh, right there, I mean, right there it says rescue. You know, you've, everyone, most people have seen the, 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 either the movie or the series MASH on TV. So that became a big game changer in aviation was the use of helicopters and their roles in combat, primarily for rescue and then also observation, troop transport. And as we come out of the Korean War, start technological changes, we start using them as attack helicopters where um, they're used from air, air to ground for CAS, what we call CAS, C-A-S, close air support. So we start seeing that evolve in the Vietnam War with the, I wanna say it was the Cobras at first, and then the Apaches, I might have that backwards, but uh, that was a huge game changer in saving lives when the Korea War took off. Well, here we go, air medical evacuation. So, there we go. Well, unfortunately, I just made a announcement that they close in one hour. I, I got into two of the four exhibit halls. I wanted to see if I could just walk through and, and get a picture of the uh, reproduction of the right flyer and then head on out. And it was my fault. I got a slow start to the morning, but I'm still getting over the jet lag from coming back from Europe, going to California, coming out here to Ohio. So, um, actually, I'm walking into the Cold War Gallery, and that's something that I was really into when I was in Berlin. A little bit in Poland, but more in Berlin. So let me just walk through that real quick. So we got. So once again, this has a little more significant meaning. I have a great appreciation that museums here in the U.S. are portraying it. So we talk. I might have talked about this when I was at the um, Allied Forces Museum about the Berlin airlift after World War II where we were in West Berlin and um, Communist Russia was occupying East Germany and East Berlin and what the in essence did was kind of cut off West Berlin from uh, supply, from ground supply. So there was this humongous Herculanean effort for uh, airlift coming out of West Germany into West Berlin flying over the East Berlin airspace. And so this is a depiction of the kids right here and the candy bomber. Uh, there's a little parachute that they made out of handkerchiefs and it was packaged with candy. I did an in-depth thing on the pilot that started that. Um, Cole candy bars and <laughs> Clarence the camel, the cargo. So I did a, when I was at the Allied Forces Museum, oh man, that was south of Berlin. It was in Berlin, but it was in the south of the main city. I did an in-depth talk on that. And there were um, a bunch of these bags I actually talked about while I was in Berlin. This is something I've never seen before. I've never seen that. A parachute dog. <laughs> they were parachuting dogs into Berlin. I had never seen that. I've heard of it, i just never seen it in a museum.
you know, so the, the, the Cold War, we're going to get into a little bit more advanced technology, um, espionage, spying, um, everything the Cold War was all about, arms race, uh, space race, things like that. There was a C-141 that I saw yesterday that it was painted white. It wasn't the stretch. Oh. So this is the um, C-141. I do not think this is the stretch version where they stretch the fuselage out, but uh, I think this is what says return to with honor. So this is more than likely the C-141 that brought the remaining POWs back from Hanoi to uh, Hickam Air Force Base, Hawaii. And I, it's a refueling version, so I see that hump on the top, but I don't think it's the stretch version, uh, but a very historic aircraft nonetheless. And then I was talking about C-130s earlier. So there's a tail if anybody's really interested. It's tail number 60177, Air Force Reserve Command. Huh. So uh, yeah, it was the Air Force Reserve that flew that. So here is a C-130, which this is the one that I jumped out of in jump school. It was a C-130. Now this is a 707. Air Force One, and I've seen the uh, 707 that Reagan flew on, that Reagan flew on in, um, ah, at the Reagan Museum. So, and I've actually been on it. This is only the second one I've seen, and I know there's a lot of history on the tail numbers. I was trying to get that when I was at the Reagan Museum. So this is tail number 26000. So let me zoom in on that. I'm running out of time. I can't tell you which, which president flew on this right now. I'll find out. Okay, so I'm not ready to do a walkthrough to a you know, consolidated aircraft with the three tail thing in the back. Um, apparently Eisenhower flew on this, so let me, let me turn the camera around so you can follow along with me. So I just walked up these stairs. There's the 707. I don't think anyone can go on it. I'm not sure. So now I'm coming into this one called Columbine 3, I think. So, so wow, this is, this is kind of cool. You get to, you're out here by yourself. The one at the Reagan Museum, the 707, they have uh, docents here. And I don't think they let you film or take pictures on that one. I don't remember. And cargo areas, I guess. Stow your luggage. This is probably where the president area would sit. His aides. It's a shame we got about an hour left for this museum. And I don't have a lot of film time left. So I'm probably going to have to take some stills of... Um, I got some of those army wool blankets at home. So I did a walk through a couple of the presidential aircraft. But I'm actually inside the C-141. The presidential ones, everyone's going on them and it's very tight and congested. But uh, the C-141 is significant for me because this is what I jumped out of as a paratrooper. Uh, these are called uh, jump seats, I think. They were the netted ones. They come out far so the net would accommodate the, um, uh, the parachute. Wow, this one's signed by all kinds of people. But I've used that lavatory in there. Definitely have used those. Uh, sometimes we had a comfort pallet. There's different configurations you can bolt stuff on to the ground. I think these are called Evan seats and you're always facing backwards. The significant thing, so I both in the Army was a paratrooper out of this and um, as a medevac fighter when I crossed over to the Air Force, we had it in this configuration. Sometimes we'd have a bunch of these seats and then in the middle we would have the uh, patient stanchions that came from the ground. I'm not sure where the four... 45th was though but uh, yeah I would have to um, be familiar with all the exits how that oxygen hooked up I think this might, I don't know if this is the stretch version or not but um, in the middle here we would have a bunch of stanchions where we load the patients and the, and the litters as we flew them around you know wherever we were going oh here's the stanchions here they're up in the ceiling that's where we would keep them and we would that's they're 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 stored there, and then we would pop them out. We you, you pop them out because they're pressurized with the spring, and they would go into the floor, and then they would go linear up and down. 
but those were the uh, those are the patient stanchions. Oh, interesting how they still have them in the aircraft. There's like two or three sections that they stowed like that. But they still, that's cool, they still have them. I, I have pictures I can probably put on my Facebook of how we use those. Um, when I flew out Honduras and Nicaragua, I have some photos of that. So I'm in the C-130 exhibit now, and they actually have a medevac team mock-up in here. But you can see how the stanchions I was talking about, how they clip in the top. Those will clips into the litter. You got two litter patients, and then they, they snap into the bottom. But that's what it would look like, very similar to the 141. Now, I did do some training on this aircraft, but it wasn't my primary.